In this episode, we delve into the unique exegesis methods developed by the Wellhausen School of Biblical Criticism. Initially, biblical stories were seen as mere historical records, but Wellhausen's approach revealed their true nature, a blend of myth, folklore, and editorial manipulation aimed at concealing and obfuscating historical events. The critics didn't distinguish between miraculous events, fictional tales, general historical phenomena, and details dependent on subjective interpretation and preconceived notions. They transformed into interpreters of texts, often blurring the lines of distinction. The theories about the worship at Sinai, Seir, and Kadesh and their significance in pre-monotheistic Israel are well known. However, these lack evidence of altars, worship, or sacrifices at these sites, just like Mara and in Mishpat. These places are mentioned only in passing, related to the desert journey, without any indication of their central role in the life of the people. This illustrates how dreamlike narratives are often accepted as scientific theories without substantial proof. The researchers zealously sought evidence within the biblical literature itself for a non-monotheistic stage in Israelite religion. However, these evidences are mostly imagined, based on ancient sentences and homiletics, especially the blurring of concepts. Many biblical verses have been hyper-analyzed by scholars to the point of absurdity to prove that not all Israelites were monotheists. However, these interpretations teach us nothing substantial. Critics have invented entire narratives, finding support in the scriptures, often after making corrections and adjustments. As Kaufman notes, a typical biblical scholar revises and manipulates verses at will, interpreting them as raw material and then finds in them whatever he has inserted, particularly favoring vague verses for his most revolutionary hypotheses. There's been a tendency to twist and turn obscure verses into proofs of the most radical ideas, since no one truly knows what is written in them. This reckless homiletics in biblical research has enabled all of this. The interpretation of biblical apocalypticism and the messianic figure by Gressman and others following similar methods is based on forced and sometimes imaginary interpretations of the scriptures, taken out of context. The difficulties in the narrative sequence are trivial issues for these researchers. They often rearrange verses to fit their own interpretations, which are often the exact opposite of what the text plainly states. The story of Cain in the Torah is interpreted as explaining why the Kenite tribe wandered in the desert, marked by a sign on their foreheads. However, according to the Torah, Cain and his descendants perished in the flood. The Kenites were a Semitic tribe with no such mark, and their sons were not wanderers. Cain himself is explicitly mentioned as a farmer, and his son Enoch built a city. The Kenites were always favored in Israel, but these facts seem to be of little consequence. In context to the formation of the Book of Judges, criticism has concocted a perfect story. The author of the book attempted to show 12 judges from 12 tribes. But such a profound and beautiful intention finds no expression in the book, and its faithful and naive readers for nearly 3,000 years fail to understand the book's basic intent. For this purpose, they do not count judges like Abimelech, Eli, Samuel, Samuel's sons, and certainly not Moses and Aaron, the elders, and Joshua. There was a need to invent that there were judges from the tribes of Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Gad, and Asher without any mention in the book. Yet, this legend has found its way into all our textbooks. Taking things out of context has become a popular hobby among researchers. The latter prophets did not completely reject worship as Wellhausen and his followers thought, based on a few isolated verses. Their opposition to the worship of their time was aimed against the tendency to limit religious demands to the sphere of worship alone. It's now clear that the earlier critics' view that the prophets oppose sacrifices is null and void. The entire religion, even in the prophets' view, was anchored in worship. In the field of fantasy, some interpreted the years from Adam to Abraham as mathematical puzzles with no real significance just a sequence of imaginative mathematical games to prove whatever they wish. Interpreting a verse about Caleb and his wives and children as a cryptic record of his travels and settlements is another example of over-interpretation. Similarly, interpreting a verse about teaching laws to Jacob and Israel as divination and guidance is an overstretch of imagination. The interpretation of Ruth the Moabite as a sacred prostitute and the sons of these prostitutes as orphans is another stretch. 
The interpretation of biblical metaphors as literal truths shows a lack of understanding of poetic language. In conclusion, while traditional interpreters in Germany like Samson Raphael Hirsch and others work to explain the Bible according to its plain meaning in a scientific philological way, their German biblical critic counterparts indulged in esoteric homiletics as if they were mystical rabbis or hidden Kabbalists. This led to a myriad of interpretations, often far removed from the actual text, driven more by the critic's imagination and preconceptions than by the text itself.